Welcome to Autism Today, a show about issues facing individuals with autism and their families. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, the state of the research. We're going to um, be speaking to a couple of individuals who are going to tell us um, about treatment research, about biomedical research, important information, uh, especially for families whose children have just been diagnosed. I'm really happy to have our first guest here today, Dr. Peter Gerhardt. Uh, Dr. Gerhardt is the director of the Upper School at the McCartan Center, and he's also uh, the president of the Scientific Advisory Council for the Organization for Autism Research, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Welcome. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, Peter and I have known each other for a long time, so uh, he was the first person I thought about when, uh, when I was trying to come up with some people to talk to us about research. So I'm a, I'm a parent, and I have a, a two-year-old that was just diagnosed with autism. I run to the internet, and I scour, and I find 50 million different things that the internet is telling me I should do. What, what does the research, for, as, a, as a clinician, what does the research right now support? What does it tell us that we should be doing? Um, by far, what the research says right now is that parents should be looking at early intensive behavioral intervention, getting their child into um, an ABA-based program that provides 30 to 40 hours a week of intensive direct instruction. Um, the research indicates that we have the greatest probability of a best case scenario losing di losing an individual's diagnosis, but if that doesn't happen, which is true in the majority of cases, we still end up with a more advanced child. We still end up with a kid with more skills. And if you're running a race that's as long as your life, you want a bit of a of a head start. Sure. You what know. tell me what you, you use the word ABA. What is ABA? Um, ABA is Applied Behavior Analysis. It's a, a, a system of investigating and modifying behavior in a way that results in positive behavior change. Okay, so, so that would be the, the first thing I would want to do is really look for a program that would offer ABA services. And does that happen everywhere? Is there, is there other competing interventions that are out there? Oh, you know, there are any number of competing interventions out there. Um, I think at last... Uh, count on one internet site. There's something like 280 different autism interventions wow. that are available, of which only about four have any research to support um, that they have any efficacy whatsoever. Um, one thing, however, is you know Roy Grinker, who's a professor at George George Mason, a parent of a kid with autism. Um, he he one time said that when he was his child was growing up, he said one of the challenges was that. There was nothing you could do. You didn't know what to do. There was no information. Right. He said, he said, now parents are sort of overwhelmed with information. And then he went on to say, and now there's plenty you can do. He said, much of it doesn't work. He said, but at least you feel like you're doing something. Right, right. But what's the harm? I mean, I, I guess if I looked on the internet and I didn't weed out what was research-based and what wasn't, and I just said, well, let me try this, but there's no evidence that says it works, what's the harm? Well, you know, the harm is, especially with young kids, is that we have a, a relatively small window of opportunity um, to really interact, because all, all learning is brain-based learning. Like, you actually change the brain when you learn something new. Um, neuroplasticity, we know, is at its highest with very young kids. So if we want to enact as much change in how the brain takes in information and processes information, like, that's our optimal time to do it. Um, I do think that the one commodity that we don't have um, throughout an individual's lifespan, quite honestly, is time. Like, Early intervention, we have a short window of opportunity. Right. Kids going to education, we still, there's so much we need to teach. There's so much that wasting time on things that don't work. Right. Um, I think that's the cost. Sure. The cost isn't dollars. The cost isn't health issues in many cases, but the cost is wasted time. Right. So um, the research now basically supports that applied behavior analysis done intensively, done early, is your best shot. Absolutely. And I'm um, a parent. Where do I go to find it? Well, <clears throat> every, uh, every state has a state association for behavior analysis, but also um, contact other parents. Like, mm. you know, go, to, go on the website, type in ABA, find somebody who is um, or a program that hires board certified behavior analysts. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that you really want. Those are the people that understand um, applied behavior analysis, particularly as how it may relate to your son, your daughter, um, at particularly that given point of your life. So um, 
one of the challenges is that there's not a lot of good providers out there right, right. now, given the numbers of kids being diagnosed. Right. right. Um, so parents need to start early and don't be afraid to push a little to get into a program. Right. Okay. That's great. So um, I, I know, as I said, when I when we first started talking that there's a million different things out there on the internet, but at, in your role as the uh, scientific um, advisory council president for OR, uh, which provides funding for applied research, um, you guys have funded so much research in the last decade. Just tell me maybe in very briefly, one or two really exciting projects, things that you think might really impact on the lives of people mm -hmm. today. Um, well, you know, it, it's interesting because sometimes you fund a study and you're not really sure where it's going to go. You think it's a good idea. Um, you think the data are going to be valuable, but you're, you're not 100 percent sure. But um, and, you know, as being a member of the council that probably seven years ago, we funded a study by Karen Pierce out of UC San Diego, which um, actually looked at developing brains of very young children of right. baby sibs projects. Um, which we were like, this is important, but do we, is this what Orr wants to do? And um, she then used the, well, we funded it, but she then used the results of her pilot data from our study um, to get another grant and then another grant. And now she's doing research looking at eye tracking of infant SIBs that actually results in about a 70% prediction rate for whether or not a child will later develop autism. Yeah at the age of one. Yeah, that's, we talked about that in our first show, um, about how important it is to try and get kids diagnosed earlier and earlier while we've got this brain plasticity. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. great. How about, you know, for 15-year-olds or 18-year-olds, what's happening in the, in the treatment research for that population? Well, you know, I think we also funded, which I think is, is a really interesting study because it did nothing directly to individuals with autism, which was John Campbell out of the University of Georgia, where he looked at how much information and at what form do you give peers of kids with autism who are included to promote social inclusion. Mm. So he said, let's stop worrying about changing his behavior. Let's change the behavior of everybody else in his class. Yeah, wouldn't that be great? Yeah, which was a really nice, um, a nice approach. Um, getting into adulthood. You know, we have Paul Wayman who looked at how do we get kids competitively employed, yeah. kids with classic autism competitively employed. And now we have Paul Shattuck um, going through what's known as the National Longitudinal Transition Survey data, the, the NSL, NSTL, um, and in effect data mining. And he's coming up with some really interesting results about what services kids had before they graduated and now don't have after, like whether kids are working right. or not working, do they have friendships? You know, it's uh, information that we've sort of known anecdotally, but now we're getting the data to support right. um, that, that chasm that kids face really is a chasm. Right. Uh, we have a few more minutes before we go to the break. So let's kind of wrap this uh, part up by maybe trying to explain to a parent um, what are some things they can think about when they're looking in the internet or they're talking to somebody or reading a magazine article about how do you know uh, good research from bad research or good research from no research? Mm -hmm. Like just a couple quick pointers that might help them navigate this system out there. Yeah, um, uh, number one, it, it really is, you know, research, research, research. And the fact of the matter is, you know, three stories don't constitute research. Right. You know, just because there are three anecdotes about this, it doesn't mean it's research-based. Um, the reason that that's so important is that good research either stands the test of time or we get to change our philosophy. Right. Like, we're proved right or wrong, and then we can go on. We don't have to stick to something. There are a number of resources out there. On the web, there's Association for Science and Autism Research. There is the Organization for Autism Research, and we have a number of guidebooks, including a parent's guide to research, so right. they can actually understand the difference between what's research and what's not research and good research versus very good research and even there's some bad research out there that yeah. gets published. And so. they can they can download these guides for free. Absolutely, the, right. They're yeah. free PDFs that they can get. Yeah, it's a great so. it's a great resource. So great, terrific. Uh, I'm gonna have you stick around, but we're gonna go for a break right now and then when uh, we come back we're gonna have Dr. Eileen Hopkins talking to us a little bit about the biomedical research and what's happening in that area. Welcome back to Autism Today. Our, our next guest um, is Dr. Eileen Hopkins, and uh, Dr. Hopkins is the Deputy Executive Director at the Eden Two Programs. Uh, she and I have worked together there for over 20 years. Um, I consider her one of the uh, most knowledgeable people about drugs and 
um, biomedical research and, and various other things. So, um, you know, I'm going to ask you the $50,000 question, Eileen. Do we know the cause of autism? Huh. Um, short answer, no. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, actually. we don't. And um, we all wish very much that, mm -hmm. that we did. Um, but we do know a lot. Um, and we know a lot more now than we knew years ago about um, different factors that may contribute to autism. Um, we know there's a strong genetic component. Mm -hmm. Twin studies show that uh, monozygotic twins, identical twins, have much higher rates of concordance, where both twins would have mm -hmm. autism, uh, than dizygotic or fraternal twins. Um, we know that um, multiple genes may contribute to autism. Um, there's a possibility that some cases of autism may be caused by a single gene, but uh, the likelihood is that multiple genes are contributing. And additionally, there's a strong likelihood of uh, an environmental component as well. So there may be cases, when you think about genes, um, you can have a single gene that, um, or genetic difference that has uh, high penetrance. Basically, on its own, it can cause a disorder like autism. Right. Or you can have genes that maybe create a susceptibility to autism, um, and then in combination with other genetic conditions or environmental conditions result in the disorder. Right, so I read an article recently about um, the uh, dizygotic twins and how there's a higher rate of autism than you would expect. Uh, and so that kind of led to the idea that the environment in the womb actually played a role? Yeah, that's a, a very recent publication um, from data, uh, I believe from California, which was a large scale study. And studies like that have been done before where we looked at differences in um, the mi monozygotic versus dizygotic twin um, relative concordance ratios. But this study showed a, a much higher amount of uh, autism concordance among fraternal twins who aren't genetically identical right. than you would expect. And um, they had a higher um, level of concordance than brothers, siblings, sisters. So uh, it suggests that there may be, whether it's um, uh, in the womb, whether it's in uh, immediately after birth, we don't know. Right. The timing is at early in development, middle, late development, post-birth. But um, the, there is a suggestion from that study that uh, environmental component may be stronger than we initially thought. So if I have a child with autism or a cousin with autism or an aunt with autism, I'm at greater risk, I guess, because of the genetic component of having a, another child on the spectrum? Um, I would say we don't know. Um, so there may be cases where uh, the genetics are hereditary in the sense that um, the gene responsible is present in the parents and family members. And there are probably also cases where it's, uh, the, the changes are de novo. They, they occur for the first time. Something right. happens in the individual. So right. um, it's not a clear answer. OK, so let's talk a little bit now about biomedical treatment because um, you know, as we spoke with Peter on the internet, you're going to go and you're going to see things ranging from, you know, tarantula blood all the way up to diets and vitamins. What what is real and what's just out there? Okay. Well, what's real is what Dr. Gerhardt referenced is early intensive applied behavior analysis. You know, people don't think of of ABA as um, a biomedical treatment. But in a sense, it is. Mm -hmm. it's, it's changing people's brains. It's right. intervening at an early level of neuronal plasticity where you can make meaningful changes. And we've seen, I and mean, you've seen through your sure. uh, years of experience, the way that children can change with really effective, intensive early treatment. Um, but there's a lot of stuff out there that maybe seems promising in the sense of a magic bullet, um, and um, you know. But a lot of most of the time doesn't pan out, and so far hasn't. So, and in fact, some kids are subjected to treatments that could potentially be dangerous. Um, right, chelation therapy. Chelation was big back in, um, I guess, the, uh, well, throughout the, the 2000s. And there's no evidence supporting its effectiveness in, um, in helping kids with autism or adults with autism. The thought was that there's heavy metals that can be chelated or taken out of the blood through administration of these drugs. And um, they just don't, they don't work. There's no right. evidence. And I think I read that somebody actually, a child with autism actually died. Yeah, that's the. Um, the, the bigger edge of the risk is that some of the treatments that are being marketed to families of kids with autism are not only not effective, uh, some of them aren't even safe. Gluten-free, casein-free diet. Gluten-free, casein-free diet is something that um, seems 
safe, <laughs> um, changing you know, what, what foods are offered to children in the hope that if there's some sort of gluten sensitivity or casein sensitivity, you, there'll be an inflammatory process that if you stop it, the children will do better. Um, a comprehensive meta-analysis of research, 15 different studies showed that um, the studies that are out there to support it are methodologically flawed, and some actually don't support it. So overall, the finding is, is there's not clear evidence for its efficacy for kids with autism, right. and, and there are potential consequences in terms of diversion of treatment resources, um, cost uh, for families, it's stigmatization, kids yeah. who have to eat different food than the peers that they're in school with, and even uh, decreased cortical bone density. So, you know, sometimes things um, seem benign and, yeah. and, and aren't. Yeah, it's very difficult because I know we have a lot of families who come to us and say, I want my child on the gluten-free, casein-free diet because Jenny McCarthy said it will cure my child. Um, and it's difficult because there are these potential side effects. Yeah, and, and if, if, a, if a child has celiac disease in addition to autism or if they have a severe food issue that's diagnosed medically, right. um, then there may be a role for a certain subset of kids that happen to have autism. Sure. Um, but it's not a treatment for autism. Um, the only caveat to that, I would say, is that if a parent did try one of those diets for whatever reason, despite the lack mm -hmm. of support, only if they saw an immediate, acute, really significant change in the right. child's presentation and functioning should a diet like that really be and, continued. And work with the school. I mean, if, our, if they came to our school, right, we could evaluate whether or not there were changes in the child after the diet was implemented, right, and then maybe stop the diet for a month or two and you see. Absolutely. So, um, mm -hmm. Okay, let me ask you now about another big area in the sort of biomedical arena, which is medications. Um, I know that, that especially as a lot of our, our participants enter adolescence and adulthood, many of them are on medications, but even some young children are. Where, where is the research right now in medications and autism? Okay, um, first there are no medications to cure autism. There are no medications to treat autism, the disorder per se. Um, there are two medications that are approved by the FDA for treatment of some symptoms associated with autism for some children and adults with autism. Um, and, uh, but those, those drugs, and, and those are Abilify and uh, Risperdal, they're not going to be needed or appropriate for a lot of uh, a lot of kids and adults with autism, and they're also um, they come with uh, a lot of potential side effects. And right. many times with these with these medications, the full side effect profiles aren't known immediately. So you know, initial side effects reported may be weight gain or fatigue, or um, and then years later we find out, and, and this is a case in these neuroleptic drugs, some of them cause, um, in addition to extra pyramidal symptoms, can cause elevated blood sugar, can cause um, uh, elevated prolactin levels, which can cause uh, breast tissue growth, and also can cause um, early onset diabetes. So, right. you know, drugs um, have a role um, in helping some symptoms for some people, but the decisions have to be really made carefully. Right, right, because there, there, I also have heard this concept that um, oftentimes there's a paradoxical effect. Right. Uh, can you explain what paradoxical effect means? It just basically means it's the opposite to the effect that we intended or hoped that um, we would have. And, uh, and some children and adults with autism respond to atypical doses of meds. Right. So they knew, may do better with a dose that's much below what's typically prescribed, um, or they may have the ap absolute opposite reaction. So